Okay, good evening. I hope you have enjoyed your work and uh, thank you for being here on time. So uh, we, Helen and, and I, we just uh, switch our lecture, but uh, you will have Helen's lecture just after mine. So it is just for convenience. Uh, so here I just remind you, I have written again the es essential formula and where we arrived uh, two days ago with the expression of the mean force as a function of strange objects, U and V, that are in fact the real part of uh, something related to the atomic matrix density operator. And in fact, U, V, and W are the, the so-called um, Bloch vector. And so if I remember correctly, I am now dealing with the optical Bloch equation. And the optical Bloch equation is just the evolution of the atomic density operator and often it is called sigma and in case of two level atoms you have the diagonal terms which are simply the population of the excited and of the ground level and the off diagonal terms are the coherence between the ground and the excited levels. So on the diagonal, you have two real quantity and off diagonal, you have two complex quantities, but you have extra relations so you have the sum which is equal to one and you have also the fact that the two off diagonal elements are conjugate one of the other. And so this means that instead of having six real quantities, because of these two relations, you have just three of them and they are uh, related directly to the U, V, and W that I have uh, given there. Okay, so now what is the master equation? So it is the evolution of the uh, this operator and so you have d sigma over dt which is sorry one over i h bar and you have the hamiltonian the atomic plus atom laser and commit the commutator with the operator and in fact we just treat the coupling with the vacuum as a relaxation term. So this is a simple way to treat the coupling with the vacuum. And what, in fact, we, we can write explicitly this part So for the excited population, it is rather easy. You just have one decay cha channel with a rate gamma. So the population decreases with the, uh, the, life, the rate of the excited state. Obviously this population which is leaving the excited states can go only in the ground state. 
So here you have the plus sigma e e, and the off diagonal terms just decay with half the rate pz divided by 2. So this is the usual um, relaxation operator for a um, ground excited transition. If you have a uh, transition between two excited states, you can have different gammas somewhere, and so it may be different, but for the moment, I just restrict myself to the case where the ground state, the J, is really the ground state, so it's the only populated level. So now we just have to e make this explicit, and so you just have the evolution of the population. So the first term is this one, minus gamma, sigma. And then you have to uh, check what terms are coming from here and coming from there. And I hope you will believe me. It is a good exercise you can check afterwards. But uh, sorry, no, no, I have to to be careful. So, in fact, the population comes from the coupling with the coherence and now the evolution of the coherence so you have obviously this term but for the coherence you also have a term that comes from the atomic part which gives you i omega zero minus gamma divided by two so th the gamma divided by two is this one sigma ge and plus omega one divided by two sigma gg minus sigma ee and you have uh, plus omega l sigma okay so <coughs> Obviously, this is written in the case of the rotating wave approximation. And because here we have selected the term that goes, so the sigma GE evolves as I omega LT. And so this term is almost constant in time. So it, it evolves slowly. And we have neglected the one with here a plus sign. And so this can be seen in an easy way if you want to, you can just make a perturbation theory and just start from the zeroth order. So if you just suppose that omega one is small, very, very small, then you start at the first order with the GG population, all the atom is in the ground state at order zero, and you have nothing in the EE, the population of the excited state is zero, and the coherence, you have no field. So at the zeroth order, you have no coherence. So this is the zeroth order. And then you just plug in this equation to know what happens at the first order. And so here you have the first order, you have, you have just uh, zero for the first order. So for sigma EE at the first order, 
you take this quantity at zeroth order, so it is zero. So you have no source term, you have only only the d decay terms, so this drops to zero. And but you have here you have a decay term, but you have a source term. And this source term is just uh, here. And if so you have a force the an equation which is analogous to a force oscillator because here you have just you have the natural frequency which is omega zero and you force with the frequency omega l and so you look for a solution which is sigma e g g e times so this is the one uh, exponential i omega l t plus phi and then you just rewrite everything here and it find you find that this coefficient <coughs> is sorry in fact you you, you look for the forced so, so, uh, the forced solution so it is at this frequency no uh, no this one is complex so yes no 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 uh, I have no problem with complex uh, numbers so <laughs> so this is just omega 1 divided by 2 divided by omega L minus omega 0 uh, minus I <coughs> gamma divided by 2 and so at that point you see clearly that if you had considered the non-resonant coupling, so with here a plus sign and here a minus sign, you will end up with here a plus instead of the minus. And so in the denominator, you would have an optical frequency which is much larger than the detuning or the natural frequency. So this is a, a nice uh, way of seeing, of for looking for the RWA, the rotating wave approximation. Yes. Omega one. Yes. Lindblad form. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, so. In fact, y you ca you can uh, write. So I have somewhere the Lindblad form in the general case. So <coughs> um, the justification of that. So th the Lindblad form is just a, a mathematical justification that tells you that your uh, relaxation operator has to have a constant trace and uh, so it will uh, this gives you some constraints on the form of the relaxation operator and the lean platform I do not remember I don't some tu l'as sous les yeux mais moi je l'ai écrite quelque part mais je sais plus où donc ah ben bah voilà So if you want to know everything, <coughs> it is based on the lean blat, no T, sorry, form that tells you that the general form for the relaxation is minus gamma divided by 2 and you have s minus sigma plus sigma s plus a n minus minus 2 s minus sigma s minus 
where this S plus is the raising operator and S minus is the lowering operator. Yes, sorry. And so this is the general form. And if you have several channels for decaying, you just have to, su to sum everything on the various levels and of the various channels you have. And so this is the, the general form. <coughs> and so this gives you, sorry, this gives you one here, which is this one, two times one half, and one half for the half diagonal terms. So we can discuss it later if you want, but uh, I am lost, no. Not yet. Okay. You want it? I can erase it. Yes, no? Okay, so we want now to solve this system which is which is a system of two Differ coupled differential equation with a forcing term. You have here a forcing term. And if you just forget, if you just put omega 1 equals 0, then you have a very simple system and everything decays with the rate gamma minus 1. It goes to a steady state where you have 0 for sigma e and zero for sigma j, j e. And so this is not really interesting. And with the broadband condition that was necessary to make the semi-classical description of the atom, we have also the uh, fantastic property that the internal terms, uh, time is, uh, sorry, much shorter than the external time, which means that we are not interested in the transient evolution of the, these quantities, but we are only interested in the steady state. So what we have to solve is not the transient regime, but only the steady state where we can just write that sigma EE in the steady state is then you just reuse that and you find that it is W steady state plus one half and the sigma GE in the steady state is U steady state plus I D steady state times exponential e i omega t plus phi. And you just have to plug this solution, this steady state solution in the equation. And you just have to write properly all your equations. So you have three equations. And is rather easy because on the left side I put always zero gamma divided by two u stationary plus delta v stationary zero equal minus gamma divided by two v stationary plus u sorry and omega 1 w, w that. So these two equations come from here. You, you just put here, you, so you have the deri derivative of this, so it is a minus omega L, I omega L times itself. So it will be grouped with this one. And so for the real part, you have 
nothing coming from here because of the i that is here and so you have just gamma over 2 times the real part and here you have i delta times the imaginary part so it is this term and for the second one you just it's the just the imaginary part of this equation and so you have here the imaginary part coming from that the real part because of this i and you have this contribution that comes from the forcing term that is here and the last so the first equation that is here it is simpler because you have zero equal minus gamma oh, sorry this is w slash n line plus one half and you have omega 1 times v station again this is real and here you have the imaginary part so this is already v and so it is it gives you this equation okay easy you take this one which is simple you express u as a function of v you take this one it gives you w as a function of v you just plug u and w here and you have an equation on v which is minus gamma over 2 minus 2 delta 2 divided by gamma minus omega 1 squared divided by gamma up times this that plus omega 1 divided by 2 equals 0 you want me to derive it or you you trust me you trust me very nice sorry it is the difference in the excited and uh, ground state population it is written down down there and it is also written here and you have the sum of the two population which is one so the two definitions are equivalent so we just end rewriting that as omega 1 divided by 4 delta squared plus 2 omega 1 squared plus gamma squared and you have v stationary which is u sorry which is 2 delta omega 1 divided by the same thing and you have w stationary plus one half which is sigma ee stationary which is omega 1 squared divided by 4 delta squared plus 2 omega 1 squared plus gamma. So it is often convenient to introduce the saturation parameter as omega 1 squared divided by 2 divided by delta squared plus gamma squared divided by 4 and at that point you can rewrite a lot of things as for instance this one becomes 1 divided by 1 s divided by 1 uh, 1 plus s maybe one half of that um, just one half for instance <coughs> Okay, so here we are, we are finished.
So we have the, the result we, we want because we have the force that is here. We have the expression for the stationary value of u, v, and w. And so you just have to rewrite the force. We will rewrite it as minus s. So it depends on r, obviously. One plus s, r. And you have h bar delta and we have omega 1 divided by omega 1 plus h bar gamma divided by 2 and you have your gradient phi. Obviously this depends on r. <coughs> Okay, <coughs> so one thing that one point that can be interesting is to uh, settle the relation with the polarizability that is usually uh, obtained when you compute the mean value of the dipole operator. And in fact, if you compute, this is what. Uh, takes uh, a place in the um, Maxwell equation when you solve the problem of a wave going through uh, uh, a crystal or anything, or a, a gas sample, obviously. And what you have to compute is something that is, again, related to the, uh, the op um the atomic density operator. And if you just make the calculation, you find out that you have one component which is in phase with the excitation field and another term that is out of phase with the electrical field. And what is nice, uh, sorry, it is in quadrature. And this one is just gives the index of refraction. And this one gives you the absorption. So this one is related to the imaginary part of the optical coherence, while this one is related to the real part of the index of refraction <coughs> of the susceptibility. And in fact, this is really um, related to the spontaneous emission because it is the absorption of the field. So it means that the photons have to go somewhere so they are just uh, spontaneously emit, uh, while this one we will. So this one we will see it is a conservative, and this one so is related to the spontaneous emission. Okay. Yes. Yes, S of R divided by 1 plus S of R, obviously, because uh, S is related to the, the intensity. Yes, if you, for those who prefer uh, the intensity, you can also write this with introducing the saturation intensity. And so this is I divided by uh, IS, and you have to be careful about the factor of 2 because in the definition, yes, it is. So this is just uh, an another way to write the same thing because the rabbit you can see squared is directly related to I divided by the saturation intensity <coughs> and gamma. No, sorry, uh, gamma squared is missing, obviously.
have to check, but I think it was like this. Okay. Interpretation. And the first part is the dissipative, the radiation pressure, pressure and it is so this we call dissipative part because it is related to the same coefficient as the absorption for the, the dipole, the optical. And so the dissipative force is just minus h bar gamma divided by 2 s 1 plus s. And you have the gradient of the phase for this term. So we just consider plane wave. And in this case, you have the phase which is minus scale R. And so this part doesn't contribute because if you have your plane wave, you have just a constant rabbit frequency. And so this is the photon that is absorbed. And then you can also recognize Yes, I have written here. So this is the population in the excited state. And you see that the population in the excited state is here. And so you can interpret this uh, dissipative force as um, so h bar k L. So this is the momentum of a photon. And you have gamma s divided by 1, which is the rate at which the spontaneous photons are emitted. And if the, em the spontaneous emi emitted photons happens to have this rate, it means that you also have the same rate for the absorption of photons and so you have really uh, the meaning of this force in your hands it is just the momentum exchange due to the absorption of the photon in the laser the spontaneous emitted photons are just emitted in a isotropic way and so their momentum is zero in average so it doesn't uh, comes out in the mean force because the mean force, as is its name, is the mean value. So, if you are interested in the dependence, then instead of this expression, you have better turn back to this one. And for a given intensity, it is maximum when the detuning is zero and it has wings as one over delta squared. Um, yes, so I think this is all I have to say. Obviously, um, I recall you that here I have considered an atom at rest for the uh, solving everything so if now you have a moving atom with a velocity v then you just have to consider the doppler effect which means that where you have delta you have to put something 
which is just uh, delta minus KL V and if the transition is sensitive to a magnetic field which means that in fact the frequency omega zero becomes something uh, as j mu b b divided by h bar this is just because mu b b is uh, an energy and we want a frequency at this point you just have to introduce another detuning which is the original detuning minus a small uh, deviation which is KL V plus J mu V Okay. Now the dipole force. So the dipole force has dip instead of this is not minus uh, s divided by one plus s, but now you have h bar delta and something which is gradient of omega one divided by omega one. So uh, as a matter of fact, s is proportional to omega 1 squared and so you can rewrite uh, the, the logarithmic derivative of s is thus just equal to twice the logarithmic derivative of omega 1 and here you have it and so it, co it turns out that the dissipative, the dipolar force, sorry, is minus h bar delta divided by 2, and you can write it as a gradient of the logarithm of 1 plus s. So this shows that this force is a conservative force you can write uh, potential from which this force just derives. One important thing is that when the detuning is zero, you remember the dissipative force was maximum. Uh, when the detuning is zero, the dipolar force is just zero. <coughs> It, uh, so F dip equal zero if delta equal zero. The force, so you can work out from here, you have this S divided by one plus S goes down as one over delta squared, and now you have a delta so it means that on the wings goes down, the dipolar force goes down as delta minus one instead of delta minus two for the dissipative force. Which means that for large detuning, you, you will find uh, a region where the dipolar force will be more important than the dissipative force. So in the case of low intensities, no, it's not a good idea, but it doesn't matter. If you go to low intensity, then you can see 
that the so omega one small in fact you see that um, the dipolar force goes as delta divided by four delta squared plus gamma squared so it is a dispersion it changed sign with the detuning which means that if for one detuning the atoms are attracted in the high intensity regions so this is for delta positive you have high field seekers sorry for delta negative you have high field seekers and for delta positive in fact you expel so it is low field seeker but it expels the atoms from the high intensity Okay, <coughs> so just uh, one point, this force depends on the gradient of the amplitude of the field or the gradient of the intensity, if you prefer, which means that the best case is the standing wave. If you have a standing wave, then the intensity of the, uh, the wave is modulated with the period of uh, lambda and it gives you the highest possible rate for changing the intensity of the field. Obviously, the other so solution is the evanescent wave and probably Hélène will talk about standing waves but maybe also of evanescent waves, no? Because now the evanescent uh, fields are used to make holes in some, or to have mirrors for uh, for atoms and things like that. Okay. Yes. Fine. Any questions? No. No. Okay. So. Now we change a little bit, but I will not do that in full details, but I love very much the dressed atom picture, and so I cannot resist to tell you something about the dressed atoms. I make my PhD thesis on the dressed atom, and so it's something remains always for all your life. So. We will not make the full calculation for the dressed at in the dressed atom picture, but we will compute the light shifts and what. And in fact, it is uh, a very timely uh, occasion to speak about light shifts because it is what is the base of optical tweezers and you probably know that the Nobel Prize went to the father of optical tweezers. So, okay, first we will consider the case where we have without spontaneous emission and so what we consider is now you consider that the field, the laser field, is described by um, a quantum field. So you have the creation and annihilation operator for the laser field plus one half times h bar omega l. <coughs> and 
So I don't define the a, a, a dagger A because you know them. And what you have to consider is your two level atom, so J and E. And you have a ladder of levels which correspond to the state of the laser. So here I will say that it has n photons, no, n minus one photon. Here you have n photons, here you have n plus one photons, and here you have n minus two photons. And so you have to construct the sum of this two level object with a, a, this ladder. And if you have no coupling, then you just have this one, for instance, which is J and N minus one photon. And you have here, you will have above, you have E with the same number of photons, which is this one plus this one, which is that one. But you also have J with N photons. And again, you will have excited state with N photons and just above it, you will have the ground state with N plus one photons. Obviously, here, uh, no, sorry. Below this one, you have E with N minus two photons. Yes, maybe it's n not a good idea. No, I have a, a positive detuning, okay, that's fine. So, if we just want to write the energy of the J N, uh, it is N times H bar omega L plus one half the of H bar omega L minus omega zero and plus one half H bar and if one writes the E N minus one, it is N H bar omega L minus one half H bar omega L minus omega zero and plus one half. I have mixed a little bit the things because so here I have added one half of omega zero and subtracted one half of omega zero. This is just for convenience. And I have split the, so this is uh, N plus one half. So N plus one half. And so you can check it turns. And so this is the, now it is delta. Now, if you write the DAL operator in this and you take only the resonant part in fact and you have a so here you destroy a photon so it will takes an atom in the ground state to put it in the excited state. And if you want to create a photon, then you have to take the atom in the excited state and to bring it back, back in the ground state. Here, please note that I have put omega zero and not omega one because here this is the Rabi frequency associated with a single photon because the number of photon is there, is hidden there. So this, the, the eigenvalues, so no, not, not the eigenvalues, but the uh, matrix element of A or A dagger are just square root of N or square root of N plus one. And so 
it gives you with the omega zero, this will give you again the uh, Rabi frequency omega one. So if you, you just look here, it means that it this operator acts in this manifold or in this manifold or in this one, but it doesn't couple two different manifolds that are distant by omega L. So the next step is obviously to compute the matrix elements of VAL in a manifold. And so this is the usual one I prefer, which is this one. And obviously this doesn't couple, uh, doesn't displace this level, so it doesn't uh, play any role on, on JJ. If you just take JN, VAL, JN, it is zero because you have J and E only. So it is a diagonal coupling. And if I am right, this gives you the square root of N and you have divided by two. And if you are in a coherent state with a mean value for n, which is very, very large, in fact, then you can consider then that the values of n, you just replace the n operator, let's say, a dagger a, so it is al, it, you just replace it by the mean value of the number of photons, because you know that if you have a large number of photons in, in your field, the fluctuation in the number of photons is just square root of n, and so the variation of the, va the, the different value, the spread of the value is much smaller than the mean value. And so you just consider that all the populated level in the laser field will lead to the same Rabi frequency, which in fact here, you just replace this N by its mean value and at that point, omega zero times the mean value of n is just simply the Rabi frequency I had introduced in the classical treatment. Okay. Now, if I just consider now, I restrict my problem to this manifold because I, I saw that this coupling is just between two uh, states in this manifold. And so I can write in this manifold which I can have a H corresponding to the N photons that are present, then it is just H bar divided by two, and it, it's a two by two matrix, and you have omega one, omega one, and delta, plus obviously you have the En, which is N omega L plus this guy, but this is not important. And so this is a two by two matrix, and you know that the eigenvalues 
R just plus or minus h bar divided by 2 square root of delta y. Very often you know, note that as the generalized gravity frequency, which takes into account the detuning. And so if now you plot the energies so of the plus and minus uh, eigen values, so as a function of the detuning, for instance, then you start with the uncoupled uh, levels. So you have here what was, uh, so I have to think a little bit about it. In the negative, you have um, the E n minus 1 level that is higher than the G N level. So this is the uncoupled uh, system. And when you couple the two, you just change. You have an avoided crossing. And you have an hyperbola like that with a minimum separation here at delta equals 0 which is just omega 1. <coughs> so if you look now at what happens for the, the manifold, so I just draw it again, and this is to answer to one question that was asked uh, last uh, on, on uh, Tuesday, you see that now when you couple the two levels, so this is the uncoupled level and this is the plus and minus levels, you have now a splitting which is the generalized Rabi frequency. And if you do not and the separation between two manifolds is the omega L of the frequency of the laser. And if you do not want to mix this manifold with this one, you have to introduce the condition that the gravity frequency is also much lower than the laser frequency, which is not a problem in the optical domain, but can be a problem in the microwaves. So it is not uh, an explanation, I agree. It is just an illustration why this condition appears at some, po some point. <coughs> okay, this was just a short Duration. So if, obviously you can write the exact expression for the plus and minus as a function of everything, but I think y we do not need them, so I will skip them, but I have them. So if you want to know them, you just raise your hand, shout, and I can write them you. Okay, so now I come back to my dipole force because here I have, I see that if, for instance, I consider a beam waste, so a laser beam that shine on atoms, so with a W, a waste W, so it has a profile in, int in intensity, which is a Gaussian, then you will have the splitting of the two levels, 
of the manifold that now depends on the intensity and you have when you are so this is a transverse direction x and so this is x and if you look at the levels so where you are far from the center of the laser beam then you have just no intensity so you have the unperturbed uh, levels uh, which is the excited state below and the ground state above it can be the, the reverse for the maximum of intensity you have the maximum of splitting and so this level goes like that and this level goes like that so this depends on the detuning so I will not put names I will call this plus and this minus and so I go from a detune this is the unperturbed level so the separation is just the difference in frequency between the laser and the atomic transition and here you have the generalized Rabi frequency as a splitting for the maximum for the zero the center of the beam and so if your atom is in this level and follow this level then it will see a potential its, ex its energy will change with the position and so you will see a potential a trapping potential that tends to accumulate atoms here and so this is the optical tweezer if you are in this kind of levels where you have light intensity you are just trapped but obviously you will say that if your atom is, in c is coming in this level then it will undergo a repulsion but in fact in this picture I do not consider the spontaneous emission and what makes what the spontaneous emission will do is that the atom is neither in the plus level neither in the minus level but is switching always between the two levels and so if I want so this is the energy plus this is the energy of the state minus and you have a corresponding force which is F plus which is minus gradient of E plus and a force F minus which is minus F plus but in fact the atom is neither in the plus level nor in the minus level but it has a population for each of them in due to spontaneous emission so I will not redo the same resolution of the block equation but it is the same trick so you just calculate the steady state population for the two levels and you end up with the dipolar force which is just the pi plus times F plus plus pi minus times F minus and you can rewrite it with gradient of A plus times pi minus minus So to tell the truth, if you want to calculate easily the populations of the plus and of the minus level, you have to consider the secular li limit. Which is that the gr generalized Rabi frequency is much larger than gamma. And this approximation makes that if you go to the end of the calculation you will not find the same result as 
in the previous treatment because you have to neglect gamma som somewhere with respect to this generalized gravity frequency. Any questions? <coughs> in fact, the secular limit leads you to neglect some gamma terms respect to the generalized Sharabi frequency. And so if you make this calculation to the end, you will not have in the denominator, which was delta squared plus 2 omega 1 squared plus gamma squared, in fact, this one will disappear. Yes, obviously. Otherwise, you have no equilibrium. You, but <coughs> the secular limit is just to avoid a lot of problems in the, in the cascade from here, uh, sorry, from here to there. And so it's a, a bit tricky, but uh, um, I would say that the dressed atom is very simple, very intuitive till the calculation of the levels. When you have to go further and, to have and you have to solve the uh, rate equation, the master equation, and compute the steady state solution, it is more tricky, and so we will not do it. Yes? So, I in fact, <coughs> uh, f if you use usual material, you have an index of refraction, which is larger than one, and then you have, uh, you are almost always with light. You are on the red detune side of the re of the, the resonance. If you want, if you take um, glass or um, organic material, transparent, they very often have absorbing line in the UV, and so the visible light or the infrared light is commonly on the red side of the transition. And if you are, so this, um, in this case, uh, this is omega zero and this is omega L. So this drawing has been made for a positive detuning. If you have a negative detuning, then the ground state is below the excited state. And so if you have uh, negative detuning, this level connect to the ground state level. And in the optical tweezer, you are, so this is the ground state. You have <coughs> nothing in the excited state. So this is the view Maybe to help Hélène, I can tell that this is the view in where you consider the center of the manifold as the reference. <coughs> Very often, you consider the unperturbed level as a reference, and you call this the light shift. But it is just a small difference, an offset, if you want. And <coughs> this light shift, in the case of if your gravity frequency is smaller than the detuning, the shift in energy, the light shift, is just proportional to the intensity of the field.
because here, if this one is smaller than this one, you make an expansion of, and you just find that it is in density. Okay. That was all I wanted to say about that. And we just have 20 minutes to treat the case, the second part, which is the three level mapping. And the magneto optical so we will work so it is the map the magne magneto optical trap and we will start with a 1D geometry because 1D is simpler as uh, Jerry pointed out. And so we will consider three level atoms, but we will not consider uh, the case where you have a ground, one a first excited state, and somewhere else a second excited state. This is not what is interesting for us. What we will consider is not this one. But we will just consider then that the excited state has a degenerate magnetic manifold. So namely, we will consider a transition where you have a ground state with a J equals zero, which is coupled with an excited state which has uh, J equal one. So obviously, we will you will shout and say, this is a system with four levels. But I will restrict myself to the case where I have one laser, which is sigma plus polarized. So this laser will interact with this transition. And I will have another laser which has a sigma minus polarization <laughs> and so it will interact on this transition <coughs> and so this intermediate level will play no role and so it is I have only three level atoms so the 1D geometry I will consider is that I have the a laser, two lasers with the same frequency propagating in opposite direction. And this one is sigma plus polarized and this one is sigma minus polarized and obviously what I will add is also a B field, which is just along the Z axis also. And the effect of this field is just to shift the two levels, this one by J mu B B divided by H bar if you want to have a plot in a frequency or not divided by H bar if you want to have the energy and so and this one is minus, minus J mu B B so this is optional it depends if you talk in frequency or but yes I will keep the H bar so I can put also on this graph the frequency of my laser and so so if your atom is just at rest 
then the two frequencies are the same. But now, if your atom is just moving, then this frequency is reduced and this frequency is enhanced. So in fact, this frequency will become omega L minus KD. And here, the frequency will become omega L plus KD. This one is K. So, <coughs> now, in fact, I know almost everything. As your two fields are of orthogonal polarization, they are just plane waves, so they have equal intensity. So if you just consider one of them, you know that you will not, the dipolar force will be zero because it is a plane wave. And you remember that you will have a dissipative force, which if I consider the plus of minus beam, gamma over two, S plus or minus divided by one plus S plus minus times H bar KL. This is for only a single beam. In fact, if you put the two beams at the same times, you are not allowed to consider the saturation that you have here considered here. To see it, it's uh, rather simple. You just take, you first turn on a laser, an intense laser on this transition. Then if it is almost resonant and saturating, the population here in the ground state will be just one half and you will have the one half population in the excited state. Now you just add your third level and you take a small weak field interacting here. So you know that at the first order you will create uh, coherence in this in between these two states which are proportional to the ground state population and here because you have already turned on this intense laser field then you have only one half of the population which is available to build up an optical coherence here so it is clear that you will not be able to, same to do the same calculation for this field as, so if you turn on the two intense fields, you will not have the same result because you will have some cross saturation terms. It is a mistake that is r in the good, very good book, uh, about laser cooling, they make the approximation of low intensity too late because they first sum the two forces with this saturation and then say, okay, we go to the low saturation limit. No, you have first to consider that the saturation is small and then and only then you are allowed to consider the two beams simultaneously and then you can write that the force, the total force 
is just the f plus plus f minus. Yes? Yes? In fact, here, you have the saturation parameter. And you are not allowed to take it in, in the denominator to take an into account saturation effects if you have both beam at the same time. <coughs> yes, but they have to share the total population, which is one. Here you have just considered that the population is going either here or here. And if you want to consider that this level is just one and you have both lasers here and there, then you have to share the population between three levels and not simply between two levels. Yes? Yes, exactly. But uh, yes, you can do it. You can ask Mathematica to do, to do it for you. But you have a page full of uh, of formulation. Um, maybe if I have time, I will say a little some tricks to solve this problem. Yes. In fact, what is interesting is just the case where the velocity is just in the middle, small, and the, the atom sees the two lasers at the same time. I, in fact, so this, you have just, uh, the, the expression, so the d direction of the two forces are different and the detunings are different, but in fact, we just uh, want to work in a regime where you have um, a force uh, like that for one, and like that for the other one, and your atom just sits somewhere in between. So he sees the two lasers in the same way. Not exactly in the same way, but more or less they, they are acting both at the same time. I don't know if it is... Yes, okay, I will do it. I think it will be short enough to not exceed too much the limit of the lecture. So, So now I have just to consider the low saturation limit, so it is S plus minus much smaller than unity, which means that the Rabi frequency is smaller than depending delta, gamma, so depending on the value you choose. And you can just write at this point the force as plus minus gamma divided by two. And if I want to make explicit, so this in the denominator, you just drop it because it is much smaller than one. And here you have S. And so you can write it as plus minus <laughs> squared divided by two. And you have something 
that is delta plus or minus small delta squared plus gamma squared divided by 4 and the momentum exchange which is h bar kl and i uh, no sorry this is minus plus and the delta is kv plus uh, j mu b b divided by h bar in fact uh, i have already mentioned that in fact the magnetic field changes omega zero and the um, Doppler effect changes omega L and so if you compute the omega L minus KV minus omega zero plus J mu B B divided by H bar you end up with omega L minus omega zero which is delta and you have minus something which is kv plus j mu b b divided by h bar okay so we will consider only the case where you have a small magnetic field or a small velocity or if you prefer you will consider that delta is much smaller than delta. And at this point, you can make an expansion, an expansion of this quantity. And you just write that delta minus plus delta squared gamma 2 divided by 4 is 1 delta squared gamma squared divided by 4 squared and so no sorry you have first the first term and then you have plus or minus 2 delta delta divided by delta squared And so if you assume that the two intensities are the same and which makes the thing the things simpler then you have the total force which becomes the this part which is, which is the main part cancel because one is plus kl and the other one is minus kl and this one is just doubled and so you have the force which is gamma omega 1 squared delta delta divided by delta 2 plus gamma 2 divided by 4 squared and h bar kl I hope I have not missed a fact. No, here you have a two and a second factor of two, and you gain here a factor of two, and you sum two of them, and so you have uh, another factor of two, and so you have no no factor of two. So probably this is a good result. And if now you assume that your B field is just a gradient. So it is proportional to the position z. Then you can have you can rewrite the total force as a friction part, taking the part, the kV part in the small delta, and you have also a restoring force. With a spring constant. So this is a friction, and this is a spring constant. And so you can write 
alpha equal minus delta gamma omega 1 squared uh, h bar kl squared divided by delta squared plus l squared divided by 4 squared. So here the kl is squared because one kl is coming from here and one com is coming from the Doppler effect. And so is it is a friction, so it will reduce the velocity only if alpha is positive, and which means that you have to choose the detuning of your laser, which have to be negative, which means that the energy of the photon should be smaller than the energy of the transition. And <coughs> so just to conclude, so this change also sign with if you cross the resonance. So it means that if for <coughs> negative detuning you will cool your sample, if you go to positive detuning then you will eat up the, your sample. If you just consider a constant laser intensity, then you see also that the friction coefficient has wings as delta minus 3. So it goes down quicker than the dissipative force it is built in. Okay, my time is over. So if you have more questions, please ask. Otherwise, traffic break. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes? because most of the levels are on the same side of the light and so and they are very far and so you you have to sum a lot of, uh, of a lot of tricks a lot of, of but uh, the, the they all are on the same side of the the light and so yes yes and so obviously it is not a two level atom you know it's solid it's molecular and so on. Uh, a mess. <laughs> <laughs>